Welcome, folks, to Podcast 17. You have chosen or been chosen to listen to one of our finest remaining podcasts. I thought so much of Podcast 17, I decided to make it the site of my main, um, you know, podcast. <laughs> now, well, we're working on the intro. There's no denying it. But I think Joe and I both agree that the Breen cast from Half-Life 2 was such an iconic little short monologue to the uh, beginning of the game that we kind of want to a make that the kind of theme of the part. I mean, Joe, I mean, yeah, I, I know I'm sort of putting words in your mouth. I mean, no, no, and feel free to, you know, put put as many words as you feel are appro appropriate. You know, I, I am, I'm interested to see what people think of this and if people want more of a theme and playing around with, you know, we, we were just talking about like how focused we want the conversation to be, but I'm excited just to get into it and see what, um, what happens. Yeah, I mean, we're two, dare I say, best buds, and, and we've been making, you know, stuff together for a while, and at the very least, we've been sharing ideas. I feel like, you know, I'm not the only one, but I know you've always kind of come to me and said, like, what do you think of this? Will you read over the script, or do you want to do, do you have any ideas? Uh, will you make this asset for me? And and I think, uh, you know, I, I think with the Q&A we did, that was pretty cool, and I do promise we'll, we'll get into Zelda stuff this episode, but, uh, because I know that's where the the main audience, you know, interest is. But I think it'd be really cool to just have a a podcast kind of discussion. And I think we just have to have some some growing pain to such, you know, not to make excuses, but I think deciding, you know, what kind of segments, what kind of stuff uh, we want to talk about. Because I do think it was very much, uh, initially this was envisioned as like a media podcast. But I, I, I think we'll start with Zelda and gaming. And maybe if we have some time, maybe we'll move on to some other stuff, um, and, and keep it casual, ultimately. I don't want this to feel like uh, a Jimmy Kimmel, like, talk show kind of deal. I want this to be very casual and fun. Now, I'm going to be scripting everything I say, I guess. You know, so you Joe is actually writing a script. As we speak, I'm, I'm really talking a lot, so he has done to write his script. Um, but yeah, I mean, this will be fun. And Joe, um, yeah, anything to add before we, we start talking about Zelda? Any any starting Zelda questions or anything anything you want to say just in general? I, I do have some questions if you want if we want to just go ahead and get into it, as they say. You know, I'm I'm not Yes, let's get into it. You know, I'm not here to screw spiders, uh, is the expression that I've heard. Um Don't ever say that again. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I guess I'm curious. Um because I feel like uh, I've recently indoctrinated you into becoming a part of the the Zelda community recently, um, within the past couple of years. And I guess I'm I'm I'd be curious to hear about your background and some of your first experiences with Zelda games. And um, because there's a huge history, right? The series has been going on for decades. And I guess I'm curious about how you feel, kind of looking back at some other stuff that you know may be newer for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my relation with the Zelda franchise is pretty interesting because I've always known it existed when I was younger, um, but I never really got to play a, a whole lot of it. I will say when I was kind of younger, a, around elementary, maybe getting into, uh, yeah, it was elementary school age for sure. Um, uh, my mom knew a lady who knew a guy who we visited one time, and he had an NES, and he had all these NES games, and he owned one Zelda game, and it was Zelda 2, the 2D side-scroller one. And so I got to play a little bit of that, and I didn't get very far. It's a hard game, man. <laughs> it is, and you know, I I will admit I got the game over screen a lot, yep, yep. but it was I still found like myself enjoying it because I had played like my aunt had an old NES that we found in, in the attic like a year or two prior, so I played like Mario Brothers two and the original Mario Brothers. So like I had had my experiences with some of those older games that were kind of difficult and like that kind of thing, and having access to the internet, I was, like, watching videos about old games, and so, like, I, I just knew Zelda existed, but I never really got a real chance to play it. It didn't really pique my interest uh, in the sense of, I didn't think it looked boring, but it just, it didn't grab me to where I was like, I want to buy that game, right? Right. Instead of being young, I didn't have a lot of money, and so it was like, you know, if I want to buy a game, I have to, like, I have to think about it wisely, or if I ask for a game for Christmas, I think about it wisely, and then one day, when I got my 3DS, I got the uh, Link Between Worlds game, right? The Link to the Past remake. And I played that game to completion. And that was the first Zelda game I played completely. And it was that classic kind of top-down. And I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed that format. Um, it's a format I still really enjoyed. Hopefully, maybe we will see 
some more Zelda games do that, you know, alongside these newer ones. It's hard to be a 2D Zelda fan, you know, nowadays. We've, we've talked a lot. Hard. I mean, there's more. <laughs> so let's put that. You know, it's it's definitely the franchise has evolved a lot. And I played Breath of the Wild. I got it for Christmas a couple of years back. And I really loved it. I really enjoyed it. But also, as someone who was like an aficionado of... <laughs> I played a lot of open world games prior. There was a lot I love, but there was also a lot of like, well, this feels like Nintendo's first open world Zelda game, right? There's a lot of growing pains itself went through, a lot of lessons learned. Um, I think Tears of the Kingdom, I haven't finished that yet, but I'm making progress, folks. Um, and and yeah, I mean, that's sort of um, my experience with the Zelda games I played personally. I, I remember I went, I've had friends who've had them, and I've watched them play Wind Waker. I watched... Someone played the last few hours of Wind Waker. Mm-hmm. I love the ending hours, man. The like, I was just yeah having a conversation in the Wind Waker Discord about like the end of the game because it's controversial. Uh, there's the whole quest where you have to assemble the Triforce, and it's it's very critiqued by a lot of people because it takes a lot of time. It requires a lot of rubies, and it requires you to kind of like there's no dungeons. It's just exploring the map to find charts and then find decipher the charts and then find the shards and um it's just it feels like a lot of side content that you have to do all in order but that's that's only how it's gated you know and the game is open enough that you could be doing a lot of that content early on and it it definitely i think wind waker is interesting the way it's designed because it only requires all that content at the end but i feel like it's designed in such a way to suggest that you could be getting triforce charts early on and i love the end of the game because of that because it's more just like it's uh, it's not supposed to be, I think, a, a requirement, but I think it's supposed to feel like just a reward for if you've been exploring the world and going out of your way to do those side quests, suddenly you're rewarded because you can find the Triforce and then you go back to Underwater Hyrule and you have these great combat encounters to finish the game off. Fighting Phantom Ganon, Puppet Ganon, and, and then Ganondorf. And it's just a thrilling, um, not to mention all the boss rematches. So I think it's a really fun ending to the game and... But but not everyone thinks that, you know? <laughs> so I think it's yeah. interesting. I remember like, yeah, like I've since then, like I've I've really I've watched a lot of videos about Zelda games and, and kind of immersed myself in the world and stuff. And I think it is interesting because Wind Waker you see the sort of Nintendo, I think, when it comes to Zelda games, does listen to feedback a lot and and I think he saw the sort of Wind Waker game, get some pushback from people, and then you you get Twilight Princess. And then after Twilight Princess, you get Skyward Sword. And then finally you get, you know, um, you know, Breath of the Wild. And I think that has sort of been the, uh, that's sort of the, what they want to do now is those types of games. Um, They're dope. Yeah, I think Moon Waker just has such a fascinating story too. Like, I think that's one thing that I think Zelda games do really well. And particularly Wind Waker. I totally agree, but uh, yeah, I really like what you were just saying, and I kind of want to get into that, that like, I feel like maybe more so than any other media franchise, Zelda games respond to each other, and they respond to the fans, and there's it feels like a conversation that the fans are having with Nintendo, and I think that's what excites me about being a Zelda fan, is that I know that they take criticism to heart, and they listen to it, and they listen to notes, and they respond, yeah, like you said, Wind Waker's art style was controversial and so Twilight Princess happened and they went kind of back to their formula and they dug even further into that formula with Skyward Sword but also experimented in other ways and some of that worked and some of it didn't and so they went to Breath of the Wild which is basically like people were voicing what would their perfect Zelda game be and Nintendo listened to that and then made it with Breath of the Wild. It was a direct response to all of that feedback and I'm sure that that was also coming from you know in-house as well and developers talking to each other about what do we think people want to see? And I just, I guess I appreciate that N- Nintendo listens and uh, they don't get it right every time, but it's something that I do appreciate as a fan that, you know, I don't always feel that way as a consumer, you know? No, yeah. I mean, I think it's definitely, I think we, you know, as seen series sort of go on or sort of, you know, be in a situation where maybe their fan bases want very different things and it's hard to, to focus. Like, I don't mean any shade to the to the Call of Duty franchise, but I I do feel like that's a franchise that kind of moves around a bit. And for me, uh, you know, and I can't really speak to it like where it is now, but you know, you have it go from maybe feeling a bit samey to kind of doing something like, oh, we're doing a battle royale now, and it's uh, I I do think like Zelda is a very unique game 
uh, series because I do think the developers do try to listen and, and do try to change things because of the, their fan bases. And that is something that feels sort of like, I don't know, I don't want to get into the gaming industry maybe just yet, but, you know, I think Zelda Breath or Tears of the Kingdom did so well because it was like, it feels like people were listened to. It feels like it's a complete game. It's not buggy, that's not, you know, broken, that has a lot of content, that doesn't feel like, I think, repetitive, as some games can kind of feel when they are that big and, and they feel a bit bloated. Right. Right, right. I, I guess I want to talk about, you know, your comparison with Call of Duty, because I also feel like um, something that Zelda really makes it unique, I've talked about it on this channel before, is that every Zelda game feels different. Like, it seems like Nintendo really prioritizes their own creativity with each game. They want to innovate and not just lead the industry, but they want to just do something different with every game. Every game has its own identity. And so by making a new game, you know, it's like you see this with uh, with other franchises they do too, like Smash Bros. and Mario Kart even, that they only do new releases if they feel like they have something new to offer to the series. I think Zelda's a great example of that, that like Nintendo really wants to do something new every time with the Zelda series. And I love that Zelda is a little more regular than some of those other series. I mean, it still takes a long time, but it's like, I think that that's that's so cool for a franchise to do, just to say we're we're gonna keep making things new, and we're gonna make it the best we can. But it, it'll be something new every time, and uh, that innovation is something I really respect. That uh, I feel like has really guided what I want for my own creative process and what I want for my own projects. And I don't want to just remake my same the same short film every time. I want to tackle different topics and experiment in different ways and that's how I felt as a kid like when I found out about like Michael Jackson's music for the first time and listened to each of his albums and it's like he never made the same song twice you know each album was a completely different genre and I feel like Nintendo makes games in much the same way I think that's a really good point yeah like I, I think and like you said I think it kind of applies to most of their franchises like I think when we got for instance Super Mario Galaxy 2 that was I feel like a kind of a rare thing to get a sequel, especially on the, you know, on the same console generation that is built on the same kind of core mechanics. Because I think for Zelda, it's like, you know, there hasn't really been a Wind Waker 2. I know Phantom Hourglass is sort of technically a, I think, sequel in terms of story. But, you know, like, we haven't had another, like, boat-based open world Zelda game. And that's why I really like Tears of the Kingdom is because I think they could have just sort of abandoned certain things about it. And just, you know, maybe we won't do a Tears of the Kingdom. Like, maybe we'll wait till the Switch 2 or something. Or I think them going back to it shows that they, they did have a lot of stuff they wanted to do. And they had a lot of stuff fans were suggesting um, that they wanted to, to add to the game. And I think that's awesome. I think that's, you know, I think that's why I like, for instance, Galaxy 2. is Because it does feel like they said, oh, well, I think we can make this even better in terms of you know, gameplay and then having these really great, you know, levels and mechanics and making just a really great uh, 3D Mario game. I agree. I totally agree. I think the Mario series as well is like another great example of that. It's like, because that's something where like, I want more 3D Mario games. And we've talked about that. It's like, I, I want, you know, uh, you know, what, what do you always say? Super Mario Sunset. You know, I want Mario 65, you know, <laughs> you know, if only, but uh, they don't do that. They just make something new. And I, I don't know. I want more, but I also appreciate that. Yeah, because it's like, I don't know. I, I remember when Mario Odyssey was coming out, for example. Um, and I remember, I think Nintendo sort of was like comparing its 3D Mario games. And where does Odyssey fall into? And they were like, well, it's more like 64 Sunshine and Galaxy than it is like 3D Land and 3D World. Yeah. And I think that's definitely true, but it also does still feel very like different to me in the way that like I think Sunshine still has the sort of and there are differences but it still has the you jump into a thing and this level and there's seven different stars to you know or however many stars there are to collect and these levels have variations and you know and, and Odyssey is more about these kind of larger open uh, levels and it does I've said it before it reminds me a lot more of something like Banjo-Kazooie like a more pure collect-a-thon uh in that and then I think they could have just said like hey let us make a Mario 65 or, or Sunset and I and I, I still want that and I still think there's stuff to do with that don't get me wrong but I do kind of appreciate that they kind of pushed it in a new direction even though um, you know maybe it's not something that you know necessarily was guaranteed to work or you know I know some fans maybe myself included are kind of like you know I think 
I don't really dig the whole, like, there's a trillion moons per level. Maybe I want something a little more narrow and, and linear. And maybe that's sort of similar to how Zelda fans feel about, you know, I think the linearity in, in Tears of the Kingdom and Breath of the Wild, where they're like, I kind of miss that you could collect these items in these specific locations, and only then would you be able to unlock these things, right? Like, you have to get the hook shot before you can go here or what? Right, right. That's been controversial, and... I've seen a lot of discussions in the comments on my channel and on the Discord server about that, where people talk about the open-endedness of Breath of the Wild. And, you know, we've had conversations, too, where people criticize the um, the frictionless gameplay, right? And, and it's like there's this question of, like, well, maybe there should be a little friction. Maybe it's okay to ask your, your players to think a little bit. And maybe that's okay. And, and it's tough, right? Because I, I really think that the freedom that the Breath of the Wild formula has is is really beautiful. Um, and something I loved about Wind Waker was the fact that the game was open enough that you could go anywhere. And that doesn't mean you were ready for every challenge. Sometimes there were gates you would run into where you just weren't prepared or didn't have the right item and you would just have to come back later. So I think there's a balance to strike. And I do think that um, Zelda is still finding that because I think um, I really love how much the open world has allowed new players to get into the series. And really, ideally, I want as many people as possible to be able to share this love for a franchise that I love as well and that we can enjoy it together. And I don't want Nintendo to make decisions that alienate anybody, even if I have my own preferences. I, I like that we can all share it. And so I, I do kind of feel like, to me, that's more important than anything else and keeping that community large. And, and that that is kind of where I stand right now. But I do think there's a balance to find for sure there, a balancing linearity and non-linearity. And I think we're still getting there. Yeah. Millions must play Zelda, like you know, at the end of billions, perhaps before we are satisfied. Yeah, we need the subscribers, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, I think Zelda's in like a really good place in terms of it's like you know, I think it's it's you know making you know billions of rupees in in profits, and you know it'll make more shoe blush, you know, and um, I I'm definitely curious about what you know what comes after Tears of the Kingdom because I I don't know. I'm assuming, you know, I know there are rumors going around right now about like a, a Switch 2 or like a Switch Pro. Um, and I don't know when that'll that'll be because I feel like they just haven't, you know, I, they haven't shown any any signs of it. It seems like the Switch itself is just still going strong. And and maybe, I mean, I think they could afford to wait if they wanted to, but I, I do also, I just kind of wonder... Um, because I guess I want to talk about, like, I remember when Tears of the Kingdom was coming out, right? Uh, and I remember the trailers at first kind of worried me. Because those first couple trailers, I was like, I don't know. I'm a little worried about the reused Hyrule map, right? Um, I know, and I think that was a concern some people had. I remember it was kind of like, it seems like dramatic. I feel like people were getting kind of mad at each other for no reason where they were like... There were a lot of arguments right before the game came out, and there were still people... You know, I remember those days, right? Arlo was making videos about this even, and there were questions about... um. Um, I saw someone else's video and I wish I could remember who it was that was talking about like just like this pre Tears of the Kingdom release controversy where there were so many people that were like, okay, it's just DLC. What's the point? Why do you want me to get hyped for this game that looks identical to a game that came out seven years ago, right? Or six years ago or however long it was. And um, it, it really was controversial and just it's like, but, but like Nintendo fans knew that like we know there's more that they're not showing. We know there's something in the game that is not in the trailer so far. There's got to be, just because that's how Nintendo operates, and maybe the trailers are showing all there is, but it seems like for you, it's like it wasn't until the last trailer came out where you go, oh, they were hiding some stuff, and we started to get a glimpse of some of that stuff in the last trailer, and it just kind of opened that door of, like, there was stuff we just did not see, and then playing the game, there's so much more that we had no idea how far it would go. And, I mean, that's how I felt, and that's how I still feel, and so they did play their cards pretty close to the chest for a while, but... It was a controversial move, and I still feel like they undermarketed the game because, like, I wanted more people to be excited for the game. If there was a lot of people that just weren't because it looked, they weren't being shown enough, then I feel like they should have showed more. But, you know, I don't know. I also like secrets, and I, I don't mind being surprised. Yeah. That's the thing. I guess that's the sort of age-old question of, like, how much should you show and how much is too not, too much? And I think it varies from person to person. Because I know some people who are just like, I know I want to buy Tears of the Kingdom. I'm not going to watch any trailer, really. Like, And that's fine. I, I kind of get that. But I also think 
since there is so much with Tears of the Kingdom, I think they could have shown off a, a bit more. Because I think we all kind of suspected there were, like, caves, right? Like, we'd be like, oh, there's a hole in the distance. Like, oh, there's this one, like, half a second clip of, like, what looks like this mushroomy area underground. And I was like, I guess, but, like, I it could not be too, you know, it could be something. It could be just, like, this small area. And I think I just wanted, like, a bit more confirmation. And I think the third trailer they dropped was, like, perfect. That finally was like, okay, I'm on board. Because dungeons were the big thing for me, right? That was something where I was like, it's um my big criticism, with with which I share with so many people. This is not a hot take, you know, and this is, you know, this is only something I thought about when replaying the game. Because I love the Divine Beasts in Breath of the Wild on my first playthrough. But it was kind of on my second playthrough, I was like, there's not much variety here. It is, like... And, and that's something I don't get with other Zelda games. I can replay Wind Waker and Twilight Princess and Ocarina of Time, and the adventure takes you to so many new places, and the dungeons interest you, and you go, well, I don't know where I am, I don't know what this place is, and it's it's a new setting every time, and Breath of the Wild didn't really offer that with its dungeons. Um, so that's something I was like, into the kingdom, I just want a little more originality, I want unique bosses, and that's kind of, that's, that was my big thing. But none of the trailers confirmed that. <laughs> All the trailers were like, maybe this is a dungeon that we're looking at, but we don't really know if this is what this place is. And so it was, it, that was the scary thing for me. I, I was, I was, um I had faith that the overworld w- would be different. I know that overworlds are so important for Nintendo and for Zelda. I, I knew that they would somehow make that unique. Um, whether that was just by like, recontextualizing side quests or I trusted them on that. It was just, I was just scared about the, uh, the dungeon experience. And after I played the game, I was like, shoot, they did it. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah, for sure. I, I think that was just another concern of mine too. Cause I think like, just, you know, I think with the gaming industry, I think we've been burned. I think everyone has had a situation where like a game they were really looking forward to just like, it was a stinker. Right. And it made us kind of, you know, and I think there, there is been a problem with, games being sold that it's like this could have been like a $30 standalone DLC maybe like it does you know and so I I think it's been really cool to like you know I think that's why you know Tears of the Kingdom got so much praise and I think even Breath of the Wild back in the day and and you've got games like Baldur's Gate 3 I think getting a lot of praise and and it's it's all well deserved uh deserved and and yeah I guess just like I think they really did a lot to to not get out of the park. I think it's it's very varied and and I guess like we said, I think they could have showed more, but I, I do think they in the end I think they showed a lot. And I remember Arlo even was like, I wish I hadn't watched this trailer, which I think was interesting because for me it was like, oh no, I really needed that trailer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I'm not like the hardest core Zelda fan, I guess, right? Like uh I liked Breath of the Wild, but I had my my grievances with it. And I think it comes from someone who who plays a lot of open world games and RPGs and like I think there was a part of me that wanted something out of Breath of the Wild that like I don't think it was ever going to give me which is like a big huge like role playing experience Uh, but I also wanted just a more in-depth open world like you said I think I wanted more enemies more cool unique places to discover uh, more varied quests and I would have been happy and I feel like they they delivered on and I'm definitely like because I I agree with that like Zelda is like kind of been adjacent to the RPG genre, but even within the RPG genre, sometimes the role-playing aspect is something that very much gets forget forgotten. And I think Zelda is in a really interesting spot because Link kind of famously, you know, is is a mute protagonist, which, you know, the, the idea there is is supposedly that that empowers the player to put themselves in the character, but that's something that we don't really see much of in the series. And I'd be really interested to see either... I, I guess like to for Nintendo to kind of pick a direction there, because I would love to see more of a character built for Link already. Let him do more in the story, because I think that uh, Link at his best is someone with a backstory. I love Wind Waker and Twilight Princess for that reason. They give him family and friends and a and a village and a hometown. Right, he has a house, and all that's built into the character. He has a job, right, in, in Twilight Princess, and and all these things that tell you a lot about who this character is that we don't get from um i i don't know it's it, it's um i think that if they from something like breath of the wild that's a little more open ended but also still doesn't allow for much player expression in the character besides wardrobe i definitely think i, I i'd be interested in kind of either embracing more in either direction either go full custom character or give link a backstory 
And um, that's why I'm in support of like, let's give Link a voice actor. Let's give him dialogue. If you want to make him a separate character and not do custom characters, let's give him dialogue and let him have lore. Let's embrace that. That's my vote. But um, I'm good either way. It's just it's, they've done a weird middle ground. Totally valid. Um, because, yeah, I mean, I think uh, I get that there are certain things that are kind of staples of the series. And like Link being kind of mute outside of the CD yeah, games is like golly um you know um and i get that some people just like i i they're comfortable with that and they don't necessarily want to stray from it and i get that at the same time like i do encourage them to kind of like like you said i think push that because i remember as a kid being kind of fascinated that like super mario sunshine had like voice acted cutscenes, and i know people made fun of them i feel like and we haven't really had that since then, I mean, unless you count Mario Galaxy's intro where they kind of Bowser goes, you know, um, and he's got subtitles, which that intro goes hard to this day. But, um, you know, I, I, I kind of wish they had kept going with it. And, and I don't know, maybe that speaks to like, you know, like I said, I think there was a lot of pushback against that. But I I would love that. I would I would really love that. Because um, like I said, I think my, my dream Zelda game is leaning more into to RPG stuff. Um, but I also understand that, like, Nintendo, I think, has a philosophy with Zelda, as it does with certain other games, like Mario, where they do, and it's not a bad word, but I think want to have that, like, broader appeal. Um, right. And so I think, like, for instance, like, the fuse mechanic, I think it's, you know, it's easy to use, kind of hard to master. Right. Where I think most people could use it. And I think that's good. But I know some other mechanics are kind of, it's harder to have that sort of, you know, you can just jump into them and they're kind of easy. You know, I think some of my favorite RPGs are the ones where you could spend hours, like, playing around with character builds, right? And that's maybe something that wouldn't fit the uh, the, the Zelda-like audience or, or a good portion of their audience. So I, I do understand why they do what they do, but... But they also innovate, you know, and I feel like there's always a chance that, like, they could shake up that formula. And so, I don't know, I, I, I would never count something out like that but i but i do think that i don't know there are some things that like they have been scared to stray away from and so who knows and brand control is something that's important to them yeah no for sure um and and i guess just like uh, to circle back to the 2d zelda like i i think nintendo's at a point where if they wanted to i think they could have a studio just straight up working on those 2d linear zelda games and i think that might be the happy medium because like i don't know i think for instance you could maybe add it so like oh the dungeons are the kind of linear aspect of the game or the or the, the more condensed version or you know whatever you want to say but i i think just like you know link between worlds and and uh link's awakening are just such solid games using that old kind of top down 2d zelda style that like i i do hope that they go back to them in some way. And I don't know, they just released, not too, I guess it was a few weeks ago maybe, but uh, what was it, Oracle of Ages and, and stuff on the the Game Boy, uh, you know, s store on, on the Tido. Uh... Right, on the, the virtual console for the Switch. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe that's sort of them saying like, oh, we're going to see how many people really play this. Uh, and... I've been playing it. I've been trying to vote with my, with my play on that. And uh, it's been really fun to revisit Oracle of Ages. I haven't gotten to seasons yet, but Ages was something I haven't played since I was a kid, and it's um, it, it's so much more than I remembered it being, and I think that uh, that's why I yeah, like like you said, I'd love for 2D Zelda. I want new fans to be able to get into that because it offers its own things, right? And I think that uh, it's like you don't have to put like 3D Zelda was born out of 2D Zelda, but Breath of the Wild has definitely like pushed the series in a new direction, and I would definitely be okay with like let's keep. 2D Zelda more traditional in the way that 2D Mario's are a little more traditional and 3D Mario's are more exploratory. And I think Zelda could be the same and we'll still have 2D Zeldas with dungeons and linearity like you said and 3D Zeldas that push the boundaries and I'd be okay with that happy medium just because I, I don't know it's like I don't you know, I hate to sound like an old person but I do think that there are things I miss about those old 2D Zelda games that I'd love to keep I'd love to see the series keep going with with dungeons and with that linearity and embrace what that offers because that is something that you make the game too open and you can't balance all that stuff um it's hard to put a story in there and i've been really encouraged by playing oracle of ages because 
it's low key. Like it has a lot of cutscenes and it's way more cinematic than I remembered it being. It has great music and dialogue and way more than I remembered. And it's um that's hard to do with. I love the story of Tears of the Kingdom, but it's it's hard to. It's not a story that you actively participate in, and that that is something that I feel like is missing from these super non-linear new Zelda games. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think it's like to kind of compare it to Mario again. Like, you know, you have your two D Mario, you have your three D Mario, and they are doing different things. And like, I know for a while Nintendo kind of focused on two D Mario's. I feel like you had like New Super Mario Bros. on the DS. It was awesome. I mean, there was no denying that that game had a huge effect on me as a kid. And then they did it again for the Wii with multiplayer, and they brought the Koopalings back, and they were like, oh, this is awesome. And then they kept doing the Mario 2D. They had Wii Mario U, Super Luigi U, Super Mario, and the, the, the one where you had gold coin power-ups. But, you know, for a while, they kind of hyper-focused on one, and I think that was sort of too... I don't want to say it's detriment, like it didn't ruin the franchise, but I do think a lot of people were like, oh, I kind of want another 3D Mario game. And then they kind of had 3D Land, 3D World, and eventually Odyssey. And then, you know, I'm glad that we're getting Super Mario Brothers Wonder. Because I think like that creativity that I think we've seen with Zelda, I feel like it's sort of bleeding over into some of its other franchises. Um, And seeing the Super Mario RPG remake, which I'm super excited about, because I miss those RPG Marios a lot. Um, it looks beautiful, man. That trailer is just, it's such a beautiful rendition of its style. And I'm excited to reintroduce that to a whole new generation for sure. That's what I love about the new Mario games. Like you were talking about the new Super Mario Brothers. And it's like, I love that you said how much like those meant to you. Cause that's something that was in those games. They were kind of a throwback. It's like, here's the original Super Mario Brothers reimagined. And I love that it found a new generation. Yeah. Because I think they do stand on their own, but obviously there's so much they're borrowing from those from those games. And I think, like, Nintendo had this... There was this period of time where I think they had these, you know, these, these good balances where you had your, your side-scrollers and you had your 3D Mario games and you even had stuff like Paper Mario and the Mario and Luigi series. And sometimes those didn't necessarily overlap, but you just had all this, like, diverse content for those for the same series right 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 uh for the same ip and that was and that was awesome and i i do i would love to see that with zelda and i don't know what other forms that could take besides like your traditional like your new traditional i guess 3d breath of the wild and tears the kingdom and then also your 2d ones i don't know what else besides that but like it is such a big name i i hope they keep pushing that that would be that'd be like i think a i mean i'd be dope it'd be you know, the first game to sell a trillion rupees. <laughs> We've talked before, too, about, like, you know, they have Mario Maker, like, you know, like a 2D Zelda dungeon creator, like, that. Like I, I love something like that. I've heard other people on mine talk about that as well, and that's something I would definitely... I think it's possible, right? Like, I don't know. I, I think that Mario Maker is, like, you know, like you said about Mario games and Zelda games in general, there's a lot of mechanics that Nintendo likes to add on. Easy to learn, hard to master... And I think that uh, I think that you could do that with a Zelda dungeon maker, and it would take a little work. And there's some things that might be harder to figure out. Um, but I think like Zelda dungeons are intuitive to explore, and because of that, I think there's a way to make them intuitive to design. And maybe that would take a little, you know, being smart. You know, like level design is not easy, but I think understanding what's possible could be easy um, if presented in the right way. Um, Though it, it would not be, I don't know, like maybe I, I say that, but maybe it's it's a huge task that I don't even properly understand. But I don't know. I think I think it would be possible to make some kind of dungeon creator and especially on if there's a way to kind of build more aesthetic um, mm. variety into that, into the, its builder than Mario Maker had. I think that's something that Mario Maker was missing was more on um, creative expression in the way that like Smash Bros. stages have. Yeah. Or Smash Bros. custom stages. And I totally agree. Like, I, I do think it's something that, like... Because to me, Mario Maker, like... Like, I don't know. I, I think Mario Maker... You know, it gives you all these tools. And I do think, ultimately, the enjoyment comes from, like, did someone make a good level? <laughs> you know? Because I've seen some levels that are just, like, really awesome. That do feel like... Oh, this feels like a level that feels challenging. 
mo like maybe more challenging than most of the other levels in those 2D games or you know you know I know, I know sometimes those 2D games have like the Star World or the S World where they have the extra challenging levels I've seen levels like that that are like really cool um or even just kind of recreations of those like auto play levels and and sometimes you have one where you jump in and, and it's immediately there are 10 bowsers you know right right so i mean i think when it comes to uh to the zelda dungeon thing i think it is just about kind of saying like okay let's make these let's make a level editor let's make a couple level editors we're gonna have different games and then let's try to make sure this is kind of easy to to use and there's some interesting mechanics here for them to to mess around with and and i think it could be done I, yeah like I think it's something they totally could do if they if they wanted to, if they wanted to put their mind to it. Um, yeah. And it depends on the kind of dungeon, right? Because that's something that different Zelda games approach dungeons different, differently. And so that's something where, like, doing, like, the giant puzzle box, like, Buzz of the Wild style dungeon, I don't know that you could do a dungeon creator for that without just saying, like, open Unity and try to make something, you know? But I do think, like, the dungeons of A Link to the Past or the Oracle games or Link's Awakening, those are things that, like, you know, you you could have a lot of prefab assets for and like, you know, especially with enemies, right? It's not hard to click and drag, you know, a pre-made enemy into the into a room and kind of have like, a, all right, if all enemies defeated, open chest, small key, unlock. This is the locked door. Like, that's not hard to set up. And that's something that, like Link's Awakening, the remake tried to have a dungeon builder and it was just like rearranging pre-made rooms. There wasn't much there. And I think it wouldn't be hard to like set up those kinds of systems. Where it's like, well, let's like, let's just like click and drag. Like, here's like a button. Here's what it's connected to. Mario Maker already has some of those systems in it, and dun you know, Zelda dungeons can, you know, I don't know. I, I there, some Zelda dungeons are complex, but there's things that you can allow the player to, um, in a dungeon creator. There's there's things there's ways that you can empower them to make something pretty complex still. Yeah. I guess just like I said, I think I think it's entirely possible. And I guess just before we continue, I do know we mentioned before, before we started recording about the length of this podcast. I think we've passed by the, the 30 minute mark. I want to know where you're at. If you want to keep recording or. Yeah, maybe we get this. Maybe this is like a 45 minute conversation. How do you feel about that? That's fine. Yeah. If you want to, if you have some more, uh, a another topic you want to bring up or another Zelda related thing. Yeah, I got eight minutes left in me. So. <laughs> Yeah, and I have some steaks that I've marinated, so I definitely want to eat those. Um, Very important. So this is kind of uh, forty-five minutes is perfect, and I, yeah, then we'll we'll do eight more minutes, and then we'll wrap it up, maybe talk about this experience. <laughs> yeah, comment down below um, how y'all feel about the length of things, and uh, if there's any other topics you want to see us co cover, because we'd love to, you know, keep talking about more stuff, and you know, in future episodes here, and I, I, we've been talking about doing a podcast for a long time, and. I know we talked a lot about Zelda on this one and on this channel, of course, I think it makes sense to talk about Zelda, but definitely like, I think like we'd love to open up the conversation and the door to have more conversation that we'd like to open up the door to have conversations about other things and, you know, talk about game design in general or Nintendo or, you know, or, like, or media in general, because I think, um, I think we're, we're open to all of that. For sure. I mean, I definitely, I know this is kind of a new territory for the the channel and I don't, you know, if it is something people are just kind of like, yeah, I want to keep it to to Wind Waker stuff. That's fine. We can always move it somewhere else. But yeah, I, I definitely would love to, you know, after this, kind of think about maybe trying to have more concrete segments and saying like, oh, maybe, you know, there's a segment where Joe talks about a game and I talk about game. Joe talks about another media thing. I talk about another media. I don't know. I would love to, to workshop it. And like you said, I think make it a media podcast because I think the dream is to you know, uh, we always like having conversations, and I think if we could record those and make them enjoyable to to listen to for people online, I mean, that'd be awesome. And I just, you know, I'm always down to hear what people think. So comment down below what you think about this episode, because because here's the thing. <laughs> episode zero. Episode I'm going to try and convince Joe of the podcast name. Don't worry. Um, comment down below. We'll talk about it after the show. I don't want to waste any more minutes. Um I guess, like, you know, I like, I say this about it, all the videos that I do on my channel, right? And we've talked about this in the Q&A, is that, like, I, I do take feedback, and, and I, I really want to encourage people to voice, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not the kind of creator that's going to be so hard on a position that I don't take notes. You know, I want to know what y'all have to say, and if there's a way to make our content better, then I want to keep that in mind, and I want to listen to that. And so definitely, like, if there's something where, you know, if you have 
suggestions of topics that you want to hear us cover in the next episode, you know, I encourage y'all to comment and leave feedback and let me know what y'all think about this. And, uh, you know, if y'all want to see this uh, regularly, because we'd love to keep talking and, you know, kind of open up more conversations on this channel. Because uh, for me, it's like I love that this project has uh, created a community and I want to embrace that. Like 3D modeling is like very important for the content on this channel, that the, the project aspect. But I think like just engaging in a community and creating a space there where we can just talk about things we love together and share that with you, the audience. That's something I value and I want this podcast to facilitate that. For sure. I guess it's likewise. I don't know. Like I very much have been very happy for Joe and been happy to ride his coattail, so to speak, as he gets more popular. So, you know, that being said, yeah, like whatever, whatever he needs, to be used to I mean, that's not true, but feedback is great. And yeah, I mean, I guess if any famous Zelda or YouTubers are watching this and want to collab, you know, yeah, hit us up. It will be in the description below. But genuinely, like, I think feedback and maybe I think the reason we're doing this now is just because. There is sort of an audience potentially. And maybe it's only going to be a few dozen who are super interested in this podcast format. But as we said, we kind of just wanted to chit chat really and and think and get it out there so we can kind of start to think about what we want to do. And, and and feedback is appreciated. Like I said, I think maybe getting some more concrete segments would help, but also maybe just having very broad topics to to jump between. Right, right, right. No, I totally agree. And that's something that... um. You know, it's uh, having an audience now and, you know, that subscriber number is still crazy to me. And that's definitely something where, like, it's uh, it does change things and changes the way I approach content, knowing that, like, all right, there's people watching and I want to I want to provide value to y'all. And I think that having these kinds of conversation uh, focused, you know, having a podcast, I think that's a great way to kind of keep the conversation going and open up kind of new revenue. Uh, what am I trying to say? Not revenue avenues for content on this channel. Because that's something that, um, you know, something that we talked about after the Q&A, after we stopped recording. You were like, you know, one of, one of these questions that we didn't really get to was, what else can, you know, you put on the channel? Is it only going to be about the 3D modeling? And I think that, you know, like I, like I, I guess like I just said, maybe I'm just repeating myself. But I think the community aspect is, is, is something I really value. And I want to find new ways to create content and engage with, engage with y'all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we don't want the project to necessarily, like, when it gets finished, like, I want it to be, I think, more than an archival channel where it's like, well, here's all the videos, you know, Joe did. I would love for it to be, you know, if y'all are like, I want it to be Zelda-focused or Nintendo-focused or whatever, like, um, ideas for other videos would be great because I think we want to keep making them for, for people. Um, and we want to just make stuff in general when I think, you know, Joe said it best, so. <laughs> Joe said it, Alex said it, we have said it together, and maybe this leads us to the conclusion of the video. I have to remind you how you can support me as a creator, guys. I, I, I'm begging, I'm, I'm on my knees, but no, but in all seriousness, I, I do have to tell you, if you're interested in supporting me as a creator, become a member on Patreon. There you can get exclusive behind-the-scenes access to all kinds of bonus features, all kinds of content that you will never see anywhere else. When I'm working on my short films, I create scripts, uh, storyboards, rough cuts, previs, all these things um, that you won't see in the final product, but you will see if you become a member on Patreon. Uh, that allows you to be able to give feedback as well on, on short films as we create them. And that, that's a great way to make your voice heard and become a part of my creative process. You can also listen to music that I compose before it ever releases on Spotify. Become a member on Patreon and get access to exclusive content. Also, listen to my music on Spotify. Any music that you've heard on this channel was my music. So type in Joe Kendrick, that's J-O-E-K-E-N-D-R-I-C-K, on Spotify, Apple Music, or wherever you listen to music. This wraps up everything I have to say. Alex, how are you feeling? I'm, I'm feeling good. Um, this is something where, like, I guess I've, I've done it before. I've obviously been in some of your other projects, but this is the first time I feel like I'm putting something out there that I'm in a lot. It is going to have a, a, a fairly decently large audience, I think, you, you know, even if it's just a few hundred people. But I, I am happy to maybe help you out with this Wind Waker stuff. And um, just I'm feeling good. Like I said, I guess like we've said, thank you all for y'all's support. I mean, it's it's. I think it's just been so exciting for both of us, right? Um, and 
uh, we are just we're happy to to keep doing it and just it's it's y'all that help keep it alive so just thank y'all again and uh yeah we will see y'all in the next one absolutely super voice absolutely thank you so much for watching i'll let y'all go